Black drum here. Uh, we're seeing a few more black drum that are showing up. Um, we're seeing a few croaker. We're seeing a few spot. We're seeing a little bit of everything in the in the saltier water. So that that's really a, a pleasant thing to see this year. You know what I mean? To see the to see these fish coming back like that. And I, I think what I'm seeing, I'm, I'm really impressed this year to see the quality of fish that we're seeing around here. You know, I don't think that we've seen trout like this in quite a long time. And the amount of red drum that we're seeing it is significantly much more than what we saw last year. And the cobia that we're starting to see to the south is much more out around the target ships and stuff like that. So, um, you know, I think it's just a matter of looking around and, and rolling the dice in a spot. And don't be afraid to try a new place. And don't be afraid to look in a new area. I mean, the thing about these snakeheads, folks, is you don't know where you're going to find them. I mean, we're finding them in the causeways. We're finding them in the salt. We're finding them in Tillman. We're finding them in the Y River. We're finding them in salty areas. So what's going on with that? We're trying to figure that out. You know, I know that um, we've had a lot of fresher water coming out of a lot of the tributaries. But uh, the salt right now is, is really high. I mean, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of... I mean, it's kind of confusing some of these places that we're seeing the snakeheads being caught, being shot, and that kind of thing, you know. When they're shooting snakeheads out around James Island, they're shooting snakeheads, you know, in places that we haven't heard for a long time. I mean, something's going on, and we need to figure out what that's all about. But, I mean, the fishing's just great everywhere, no matter where you go. They're seeing, even seeing a few flounder here lately, so that's, that's good to see. And if you're out off Taylor's Island and you fish the deep channels out there, don't be afraid to, you know, drift a couple times and see if you can't pick up a keeper or two. You might really be surprised what you find out there. You know, go across the bay and go over to the other side where the power plant is and all that. They're catching a lot of fish over there, too. We're catching a lot of fish at the target ships. Chumman's been pretty good, you know, for most areas. A lot of guys are chumming. A lot of guys are starting to see birds working the surface in the little chop tank, you know, so we're starting to get some top water action on the stripers there. Um, just remember, when you come here, let's, uh, let's all try to play by the rules. Let's try to be respectful. Let's try to pick our trash up. Let's try to, you know, be, be, be gracious to the people that we meet and the people that we talk to so that uh, we can open more doors here and we can get more accomplished and we can um, – you know, get this back to where we need it to be so that we're catching the snakeheads and we're getting them out of the refuge and, and they're just not doing what they want to do for weeks at a time without being, you know, nothing at them. Exactly. So, so this week we've got uh, Rob Ballantyne on uh, on the podcast. Uh, how you doing, Rob? Good. How you doing? Good. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, well, uh, professionally, I've been a biologist for 27 years. Uh, last 10 years I've worked with uh, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, which uh, regulates hydro facilities throughout the country. Um, not here to represent them in any way, and what we'll talk about doesn't have anything to do with what I do. It's just my perspective as being a biologist for uh, quite a few years. <laughs> quite, uh, quite a long time. Yeah, yeah. So how did you, how'd you get into uh, fisheries biology? Well, uh, I think I... It all probably started with my mom and dad taking me fishing all the time and, you know, camping, hunting as I grew up. And, you know, as I got into high school and all that stuff, it just seemed like the natural path, you know. So I started looking at colleges and uh, I got accepted to a couple different ones and ended up staying local and going to Frostburg. Uh, got my degree there, bachelor's degree there, and then uh, started a master's degree at Towson but didn't finish it because I already started working didn't have the time so but that's okay because i spent uh, many of those years out in the field collecting fish id and fish uh, you know doing the fisheries biology thing what 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 i always like to ask this question you know because i i have like my first memories of hunting and my first memories of fishing um you talked about your mom and your dad you talked about you know the impact they had on you is there anything, that, like, is there, like, a special trip? Is there anything that you remember that kind of, like, might have lit the fire, whether it be hunting or fishing for you when you were younger? You know, I mean, what what really <laughs> got you intrigued? What was it? Was it bluegill like a lot of people? Was it a big bass? Was it a, a doe, you know? What? You know, I think it wasn't any specific thing. I think it was just that, uh, you know, what I learned after my dad passed away the uh, year before last is that, he had a great sense of adventure, and I never saw that in him growing up, even when I was in my teens and in high school, you know. But we would go, you know, to the ocean, or we would go to Tom's Cove, or we would go yeah. camping. We would drive to Florida and camp and fish, you know. My dad always took a rod nice. everywhere he went, you know. So I think it was not, like, one specific thing. It was the adventure of going to all these different places, you know. And, it's yeah. like, and I'm still that way. I still travel all over the country to hunt, to fish. Uh, that's what I really love about it to this day. I mean, I love the local stuff because, you know, that's what you have the most time to do, and you're right here. Uh, but 
man, going somewhere, it just lights my fire, you know. At 52 well, years old, I love to go on a new trip because it's just something you haven't done before, you know. So, so, so when you when you first started like fishing here, like, what 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 was it that that you wanted to go catch? I mean, what was like the first fish that that you? I, mean, I was like, probably grew up fishing the reservoirs with my dad. My dad was a big reservoir guy, you know. Uh, uh, Lock Raven, Pretty Boy, and Liberty, yeah. um, and that fishery was just developing, and at that same time the whole catch and release and the BASS association, you talk about the early sixties, you know, was just coming about. So it became this big attraction on a national basis, you know? So guys at the reservoirs were mimicking that, you know, progress of that whole BASS of developing and having tournaments and catch and release. That was the huge thing that started then because, you know, a lot of times before that people kept everything, you know, there wasn't any rules about whether you keep them or not, you know. So one of the great things, there was a guy named Ray Ansom that ran the fishing center at Lock Raven for yeah. many, many years. And he actually mapped map the reservoir out on the wall inside the fishing center. I remember that. And Ray was taking 8 millimeter videotape, and there's a videotape of my dad with two 7-plus-pound largemouths that he caught <laughs> over at the golf course and brought him over there. And he walks down to the rope to the ramp with a cigarette in his mouth and <laughs> lets these two seven pound bass go, you know, and you know, a lot of people then were like, why would you let them things go? You know, that's crazy. So, I mean, that was like the early days of catch and release, uh, you know, the six early sixties for him, you know? So, so, so the reservoirs, you, you, you talked about the golf course and one of my favorite places over there was Turtle Rock Cove. I love that mm-hmm. little cove over right. there. I love yeah. Feather Island. Yeah. I love throwing crankbaits on the back side of that island yeah. and catching them big yeah. smallmouth, you know. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of guys didn't know them yeah. smallmouth Rimlock Raven like that. And yeah. if you could find yeah. the schools of smallmouth, you could you could right. you you could have four or five five pounders yeah. hit the boat, oh, you know, yeah. real quick, you know. Jerry Sauter, man, yeah. he's like He's the famous guy for big small mouth. Well, it was right? funny because because people were that was one of the guesses people were asking about who was on the show. When we put some of the older pictures up there of of you know oh, with the big uh, with right, the black right, right, raven right, pictures, right. a lot of guys were asking, "Is it Jerry Slaughter coming?" I'm like, "No, not even <laughs> close, man." You know, <laughs> this guy's a special guy. Um, Liberty, you know, did you fish a lot of Liberty up there? My at dad all? loved Liberty. He fished it more than any other place, and I just was too young to learn it. You know. He fished all the foundations. That's basically what he did. They it was funny to hear fished. you say the word foundations before the podcast because that was like the biggest thing for us. Like we would we would walk in the golf course and go out to Turtle Rock, and there was a couple foundations out there at the mouth of Turtle Rock. You know, to the to the south of of Turtle Rock, and we would cast these Carolina rigs for big bass. As far as we could out there, no, we we got the maps like you're talking about. We <laughs> right, knew where right, the foundation right, yeah, was. Right. We knew we were right there. We could see it when the water was drawn down. And the coolest thing about that was when the water came up, you knew where the foundations were. Yeah. So it was like just a challenge to go there with three or four of your guys and see who could get the most off the foundation. It yeah. wasn't about beating the banks like it is today, yeah, you know. Right. Back then, I mean, I think a lot of us keyed on a lot, lot more deep structure right. fishing, and you don't yeah. see a lot of that anymore, you know. Yeah. That's something that's definitely missed in a lot of the reservoirs, I think. Some some of the guys still do it, but but that old that old uh, I don't know what you want to call it, trick or you know yeah it, it's faded away a little bit. You and know, that's what I mean? for sure. People fish the shorelines a lot, like they do on TV, and those reservoirs are you know you can catch them on the shoreline for sure, but those foundations are key. You got towns down there under the yeah. water. You know what I mean? Yeah, a lot of folks sure. don't even know that. You know? Yeah. And back in his day, I mean, now you got side scan sonar yeah. and all that. You can see exactly what it is. Back in his day, they had the flasher. Right. You know? Right. And he built it out of an electronics kit, and then he had this tube with a plexiglass in the bottom, and he would <laughs> stick it in the water and look in there to make yeah. sure that the foundation was there. Oh, that's reading cool. the graph. That, that is so cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. Cool. He was big on the reservoirs, you know. So, so, so. I mean, did your dad get you into the hunting scene? Is that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I shot so, at my first deer when I was five years old. Oh man, how about that? I don't know if I've ever heard with an arrow that would have bounced off of it had I hit it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I would say that moment probably hooked me. Where, where did where did you do your first bit of deer hunting at? It was mostly in Baltimore County, up off of Mount Carmel Road. We had a. Uh, my grandfather worked with a guy at General Motors, and he lived up there and. They let us hunt there for years and years and years, you know. When did you start coming here to the shore? I started coming down here, other than fishing with my dad, like Higgins Mill Pond and stuff like that when I was little. We would come down here. I started coming down really by myself hunting in the 80s, early, mid-80s. 
like mid eighties, right after high school. So when you stayed here and started coming, was it the sick of deer that, that, that oh, was yeah. intriguing? Is that, yeah, is that what kind of got you here? Yeah. yeah. I learned, I don't know if I read about it or what, but, uh, you know, I learned about Blackwater and you could hunt there. My buddy Brian and I got a permit and you had to pick what zone you wanted. And our method for finding what in our mind was the best place to hunt was pick the zone that's farthest away from the visitor center. And that's what we did. <laughs> <laughs> so At least you had a strategy for <laughs> So, 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 so w- w- what is it about Sika hunting and the challenge that, that really intrigues you? I think Sikas were just like, it was something different. There wasn't a whole lot of people doing it back then. You know, I mean, you guys down here were doing it. But, you know, for me, it was just like a different hunt. It was, it was like going. I, I told my friends when I went back, I'm like, it's like you're in a different state. You know, you look out on that big salt marsh and you're like, this looks like nothing else in Maryland. Ain't like hunting right? Lockridge right? in the big woods, you know? you know what I mean? Right. It's not no big woods and just, it was a hard um, method of learning back then, you know? I mean, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have cell phones. It was, you know what I mean? It's a lot of trial and error. It's <laughs> a lot of trial and error, a lot of getting eaten alive and... <laughs> A lot of people don't realize walk, that. Learning how, how, where you can walk and can't walk in a marsh. Right. That was definitely through the school of hard knocks. I think I think that the new people that are coming here, the first thing they learn is about chiggers, ticks. Oh, yeah. And, you, and, learn and, that, you learn that. And, and mud, you know what I'm saying? I said a cop, Captain John Smith, when he came up to Chesapeake Bay, wrote in his journal that the fish were thick enough that you could walk on mm-hmm. to shore. <laughs> wow. Everything on the bottom, the oysters and all you could eat. And that when you hit the land, everything either broke you out, bit you, or stung you. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing yeah. changed much here yeah. on the eastern shore. No. Do you, the do new you, land. Do you remember your first bugle, Rob? Uh, it wasn't on that first hunt. That first hunt was gun hunt, and I saw a bunch of deer out in the woods in the marsh, and I kind of just walked out there and walked up on some and shot one of them, you know. And my buddy had shot one, and that was like a raging success. It, it was funny because my first time ever hunting here, you know, we all had walkie-talkies. We had a little earpiece, you know, so we'd, hey, hey, was that you just shot? Hey, what's going on over there? You know, we'd yeah, all yeah, talk yeah, to yeah, one another, you know? Yeah, two-way radio. So yeah. I remember I was sitting up in the box, and I thought I heard somebody scream. Like <laughs> hundreds of yards from the stand, I'm like, I go on the radio, I'm like, hey, did you guys just hear that? They're like, hear what? I'm like, there it is again. That lady's yelling. She needs help. <laughs> They're like, be quiet, dumbass. It's a sick of deer, and it's coming your way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, that's, that's one of the things that intrigues me about sick of deer hunting more than anything else. Is it, like you white tail hunt, you go, wah, wah, you know, and, and you might call back, might not, but sick of deer, they'll talk to you. Man. Oh yeah, they they yeah, are they very are. vocal. I, I, it's amazing. I don't like it, but I I like it when it happens. It's too late anyway. Is is when they call you out? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the, I think the, I think the you. coolest thing for me when I first started sick hunting is I never I didn't understand why they were nicknamed the Marsh Ghost. And then after a couple hunts, they were in that I name. could hear them, but I could never see them. And I could see the frag move, and I knew they were there. And this is what I always said when I come in. I'd say to my uncle, I'd say, I should have just shot where I saw the frag move, and I could have hit it. <laughs> and, you know, the first thing they ever told me was, you never do that. Right. Because right. you don't know if you're going to shoot yeah. a deer or shoot right. somebody that's walking through right. the frag. Exactly. I never thought about that as a kid, you know what I mean? So thank sure. God I had people around me that were, you know, <laughs> they knew how loose I was to begin with. So <laughs> we better tell him before he does it because we know he's going to do it, you know what I mean? Oh, buckshot. Okay. <laughs> so, so yeah, then after that, you know, I, somewhere in the process, uh, my buddy Peyton and I started hunting a lot of public land, started using the boat, going out in the boat, uh, learned a lot about Sitka's doing that where they like to be, where they don't like to be. Uh, I learned they're very visual. You know, the key on visual mm-hmm. landmarks out in the marsh, which is interesting to me. Uh, they decoy real well. Not a lot of people do that yet, but <laughs> eventually. <laughs> um, <laughs> and they were just fun to hunt, you know. You take the boat out. I mean, it's a big adventure then, screaming down those creeks in a moonlit night, you know, and the stags are bugling and, that's some anticipation as you're going out there for sure, you know. So, so, so I know that you liked a little sick of deer, but I also know that that you'd like to do other kinds of hunts. Let's talk about some of the other hunts you've done, not here locally, but abroad, because I know you've killed alligators. I know you've killed some 
uh, pronghorn or some antelope, you know. So let's yep. talk about some of let's yeah. talk about some of your other hunts, you know, out west and some of the things you've done. We know you're a big fan of Mr. Jim Zumbo, so Jim, this guy <laughs> loves you, my friend. I do. So uh, you know, I read uh, all his elk articles yeah. in outdoor life growing up, man. Jim Zumbo, love him. So let's talk about some of those trips you had. Yeah, I don't know. You know, it's funny how life evolves. You know, you just meet people, and I've always been. I'm not really an outgoing person, but you know, you just you meet people and you meet other people through them, and it just really expands your network of people, you know, and I, and I, I cherish that. It's what I like to do. You know, I like to go different places. Uh, man, I, you know, some of the hunts, it's talk about, let's talk about that big alligator you're dragging across the yeah, man, that yeah, my Let's buddy, talk about that. My buddy Bruce down in Florida, he's a citrus farmer. And, um, I met him back in the early eighties. I mean, the early two thousands rather. And I had the hots to kill a turkey grand slam. You know? uh. So I, a friend of mine that I lived with in Idaho, that I lived in Idaho for a year, a friend of mine, he, he got killed in a car accident out there. And I met Bruce at his funeral. And Bruce said, you ever want to come hunting in Florida? Come on down, you know. Like, I don't know. I never, you know, whatever. Okay, cool, you know. You hear that a lot from people. And you yeah. just, you know, I yeah. mean, like people always yeah. say, oh, you can come hunt my place if you want, yep. you know. Three or four years later, I'm going to kill Grand Slam. Osceola is the hardest one to get. Call Bruce. Bruce is like, come on down. Super nice guy. You know, I mean, who does that? You know what I mean? Right. I'm a total stranger. He's like, just get a hotel and blah, blah, blah. He didn't know me from Adam, you know. Went down there, killed two Osceolas on his property that trip. <laughs> and then I've been back there probably four or five times hunting with him on his place and I stay in his house. He's man, that guy's hunted all over the world out of my league, you know. Yeah. You know, moose from Russia, all that good stuff. Oh wow. Just an incredible guy, you know, super giving. Cool guy, killed pigs on his property, killed more Osceolas on his property. So, so, and then so, the alligators, so anyhow, I went down. Hold on, hold on, hold on, okay. I, I, I just want to tell the people that, you know, you are a master alligator wrestler, and that's how you corral yeah. that alligator. I thought just you so. said he got that alligator in Montana. No. <laughs> <laughs> don't tell my don't tell my secret move. <laughs> the alligator crinkle. No, just kidding. <laughs> so, so, so tell us about that gator. Yeah, so he's a alligator trapper. He does it on the side, you know. You can uh, apply for tag for alligators in Florida. So I drew a tag and said, "Hey, Bruce, I got a tag." So he said, "Come on down." So, so spent nine days down there with him running his trap line which are lines you know like you bait them like they do on tv but on a on a tag like the tag i see i can help him do that because he's a an out you know a state alligator trapper i can help him do that but when we're hunting them you cannot bait them like that you have to go out at night time you can only hunt at night you can't shoot them with a gun you have to kill them with a bang stick uh so basically what you do you go out at night on a lake pick a couple lakes to go to he had never been to them Shine your light, you see alligators, you run up on them, throw a big treble hook on them, snag them up. Oh, shit. When you get them close enough to the boat, you hit them with a harpoon. It's got a float on it, and you wrestle them up. And then, oh, hell no. When they finally give up enough to come up, you hit them with a bang stick. Wow. It's, uh, it's, it's fun. I love eating alligator. I, I really do. I, I really do like the loin a lot. You know, yeah. I, lo I love to eat alligator. I probably get that at least once a month. You know, and, and I'm yeah. just the loin, the tail loin. I like the deep fry, barbecue, whatever, man. I just think that's yeah, delicious, that's man. For sure. So, so that was Florida, you know. My, why, whack him, Rob. Whack him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's cool, man. You learn yeah. a lot of little tricks. You know, no, they, hang little, neat. they hang little plates, paper plates in the trees because an alligator sees that as like, a, like an egret or something in about stress. That. You know what I mean? Oh, wow. That thing flapping. You know, it's little things. That's what I really like about traveling and hunting or traveling and fishing because you meet people just like you guys, you know, but they grow up in a different place and they do a different thing, but you all have a common thread. And it's getting up early and going and getting it done, you know. I don't know about all that sometimes. Getting up early. <laughs> I, love, I love the tricks, man. Just like, like the paper, yeah. I love the right. tricks, man. Like the paper plate stuff. That's cool. That's yeah, always it cool. Was cool. Yeah. yeah, for sure. And out west, you know, I've first time I went out west, I went with my buddy Paul and his family out in Colorado, and we uh, killed mule deer. We killed <laughs> that's crazy. We killed seven or seven of us. We killed seven mule deer on the first day of the hunt. Wow, which was just insane, you know. All had to be bucks, you know, and it took us all day to get them all out. But <laughs> that was cool, you know. His dad killed an elk on that trip. 
uh, now I hunt. My latest elk trips where I did kill an elk was with my buddy Chris out in uh, out west of Denver and Golden. Did that with a muzzleloader a few years back. And How big was that one? Missed one uh, two years later on a tag. So they're draws. You know, you right. can't just go when you want to. you got to draw right. when you draw a tag, you know. H- have you done any of the coyote hunting or any of that stuff out there at all? I have not done any, no. no. Sure haven't. So, so I know that you uh, you shot some antelope or pronghorn. Did I see some pictures of that? Yeah, that's a funny story too. Because uh, when the first time I went to Florida to hunt turkeys at Bruce's, I met Greg, who was from Wyoming, a friend of Bruce's. Greg says, "You ever want to come out antelope hunting? Come on out, right?" <laughs> so you know, I'm not shy. I'm calling, right? Right. So that tag used to be able to draw every every two years. You could draw that tag if you wanted to go antelope hunting. And now that unit, uh, it takes four points, so four years. Four years to draw it. Okay, so I want, I, want, I want to start getting into some of the harder stuff, okay? Um, let's, let's talk about snakeheads, Rob. Let's talk, about, yeah. let's talk about some of the stuff that you've done, you know, yourself. Not So let me explain a little bit. So, so, so I met Rob, you know, quite a few years ago. And um, we through met Ricky, probably yeah, Chris, through Ricky, right? ice fishing. That's how we kind of met yeah. in the beginning. Or no, actually, years ago I met you down on the farm, but we never really kind of connected then. And then yep, I think yep. we connected on some ice fishing. And and the really cool thing about when I met you was how kind you were, how sincere you were, and I think that you saw how hungry I was to understand Deep Creek. And you know, I started asking questions about bears and things like that. And right, I actually saw right. my first bear track. Nice. When we came to your, your your little place that night, we all came up there and hung out and spent the night, I think we yep, did or yep, something. Yeah, the cabin, yeah. And I remember I asked you, I said, is that a bear track? And you said, yeah, that's a bear track. And I mm-hmm. thought, holy shit, man, there really are <laughs> bears around this place, dude. I didn't even want to go out and pee, man, seriously, dude. Like, <laughs> like, this thing was, like, that big, man. Like, I was like, holy crap, you know, is that a dog? No, that's a bear. Holy shit. <laughs> and what was it? It's it's Bear Creek. Is that the name of the creek that's by you? Or is it? Yeah, Bear Creek's down bear the creek. hill. Yep. Yeah, mm-hmm. so, yep. so, so that's what made me think maybe it was a bear track you know and i think the coolest thing was that you guys actually kind of got me me hooked into the ice fishing and all that kind of stuff and when the snakehead started coming on here i mean me and you started talking about some things i started trying to help you and you know i I think you were like everybody else when i was like man this is crazy i think everybody was just so skeptical about what i was saying that i was seeing versus what other data had been released was saying you know right right and i thought I, you were lying yeah i mean and a lot of people <laughs> did you know i mean yeah. jim thompson they all did you know i sure. mean they thought i was crazy right. so you've been coming fishing here for a long time we've already established that yeah yeah let's talk about what rob has seen as far as changes in the last let's just say five years because we know they've yeah, been I mean, here for geez. over 10. So I, mean, I know you see it firsthand, and, and you can talk about the places that you used to go. Because a lot of guys want to continue to say this was never a good bass fishery. And me and you both know that is not true. Yeah, that's goodness. not true. Yeah. This was one of the best bass fisheries yeah. on the East Coast for years yeah. and years and years. Okay? Yeah. So knowing that, knowing the areas that we have fished together over the years, the same rivers, those yeah. kind of things, I know that we've seen the same stuff. And the reason I want to kind of make the emphasis on this is because folks rob's not working for the state he's not working for u.s fish and wildlife he's not working for the organization that he works for federally this is stuff that his own observation his own data collection and his own sincere desire to try to figure out what's going on here along with what we're doing so i want to say thank you rob for the time that you have given unselfishly to come down here and Take scale samples from us, collect yeah. data, you know, yeah. gut samples, you know, measurements, whatever. Right. Sure. Let's talk about what Rob's seen. And, I mean, let's be realistic about it. I mean, you don't have to shortcut anything. Talk about whatever you want to say. What have you seen here in the last five years? Are you seeing the same thing that I've been saying for 10 years, that they're just out of control? I mean, it's hard to turn your head to the fact that you can go to pretty much any tidal creek down here and catch a snakehead, you know? I mean, it's not like that with a lot of other fish. I mean, you might catch one or two or something like that, or when the perch run. I mean, everybody here knows the perch run. When the perch would run, you catch five-gallon bucket of perch in no time, you know. Uh, you can probably still do that some, you know, in places when they're really hot and heavy. But, man, I mean, snakeheads are what you're going to catch, you know. I mean, and people love them. You know, they're aggressive. They're willing to hit. They fight good. Uh, 
you know, I'm not going to say I don't like catching them because, man, they're a damn lot of fun to catch right. for sure. You know, they I mean, put no, up a fight. Nobody's ever going to dismiss that. <laughs> they won't dismiss that, right? So, you know, I mean, it kind of – a lot of ecology and biology is one aspect, but then there's, like, the socioeconomic aspect of everything. And, you know, what what is a value? You know, you, you kind of look at, you know, whole – whole things like this as what's the what is the value you know what is the value of a snakehead you know is it is it a direct value like it's you know eight dollars a pound or three dollars a pound that that would be like the direct value you know but there's other indirect values of you know the econ you know boost the economy from people coming down here uh you know the intangible values of making someone's day to have a great day fishing you know Mm -hmm. with their kids and stuff like that I mean, those are important things, and I don't want people to think because I'm a biologist that I don't realize those other things go on, you know, because I know they do, and the whole rockfish is highly managed by that, you know what I mean? Yes. Rockfish isn't managed by the biology. It's part of it, but, you know, it's a lot of the socioeconomic value of those things, of those fish, you know? That's a good way of putting it. Yep, yeah. and the snakeheads are, you know, in a similar fashion, but, you know... Snakeheads are invasive. You know, there's no arguing that. Let's stop uh, one second. Can... One second. I don't mean to interrupt you, Rob, but let's talk about, because you just used the word invasive. So before we get into, we know we know they're, they're classified invasive. Why don't you explain to the public what we mean when we say invasive, non-native, and injurious, what those classifications are? Because people want to come back real quick and say, Large mouth ain't from here. Get rid of right. them. That's a common, common you know? argument. You so, know what I mean? so, so we know we, we, we battle that a lot. So... You being where you are with your profession, let's lay it out for the people. What is invasive? What is non-native? What is injurious? I mean, what? Yeah. So, you know, um, to understand that, you first have to, like, understand the basic concept of ecology, you know, which is a science that started, you know, way back in the turn of the century where people started realizing that, you know, it's not just the lynx that I trap or the fish that I catch. It's everything else behind that in the food chain that makes that what it is. So it's the relationship of an organism to other organisms in that system and to the ecosystem itself. So basic ecology is one thing you have to think about in any fishery. So in this case of snakeheads, you know, no one's ever gone to a bridge and caught a hundred bass one day. You know what I mean? <laughs> but I you don't can know catch why nobody can get this though. Well, let's you know? say fifty. Let's not say a hundred okay. because I've never caught a hundred. Right. You know, but I've caught fifty. You know, fifty yeah. or sixty or yeah. seventy. Yeah. You know, yeah. And you can do that in you know an eight-hour day, and it's insane. And as a biologist, you can't stand there and say these fish aren't having any effect on this system. You know, that's. I mean. Yes, you want hard data to prove that, you know. But as anecdotal data, it doesn't take a genius to figure that out, you know. And I, that lo- if, I love that the way a- you're explaining this. I really and that effect can trickle down, you know. There's like a psychological thing where when, one, when you use a wrong to make your wrong seem right. So in other words, a lot of people will say, well, what about largemouth bass? They're not native either, you know. Well, they're not really invasive either, you know, and whether they're native here in these tidal rivers is arguable. Uh, If you look it up, USGS will say they're not native, you know. They are native to southern Virginia, North Carolina tidal rivers. The thing you have to realize is the development of fisheries throughout the country over the centuries, everything isn't a plus B equals C, you know, we're so used to this immediate gratification right. nowadays, you know, you know, back in 1871, they started the, the Bureau of Fisheries was started, government started the Bureau of Fisheries, right? So that was to go out and look at the potential for food sources of fishes throughout the country, in the lakes and the rivers and the streams and the you know, the bays, everything as a food source for people. You know, that's what fishing was. It wasn't about catch and release and recreation. You know, it was about food, you know. That's why NOAA is part of the Department of Commerce, you know, and Fish and Wildlife Service, Department of Interior, you know, 
Department of Commerce about making money, you know, when right. it started, and that was commercial fisheries. So anyhow, where's I going with that? Yeah, so so the progression of fisheries, you know, so people went out and, you know, they didn't cover every stream and every tidal river and every body of water. They went out, biologists went out and sampled randomly and developed a species list, you know, went back to Washington and said, this is what we found, you know. That's a lot of the idea of fishes now is from that that early, you know, 1800s uh, biological recons. So then... uh, then after that, they started stocking fish. You know, you had the Great Great Depression came along, right? 1930s, right? I skipped a long way ahead, but 1930s, Great Depression, right? Then it was a lot about food, you know? So how are we going to get these, how are we going to get people food that they can go out and catch, you know? So that's like, that was a big step in uh, stocking rainbow trout. I mean, rainbow trout everywhere in the world, practically. And they've been stocked. And a lot of those rainbow trout, well, in this country, they all came from a river in California. And then they started hatchery in the McLeod River, and then that's where they trained them out to the east, to New York, release fish so people could go catch them for food. So, right. so, I mean, I know, like, a lot of times as a biologist, you're talking about indigenous species and the effect on the ecosystem. That ecosystem's changed a lot in 100 or 200 years, you know. There's no denying that, just with people in, in the mix to begin with. Uh, but, you know, are, are biologists looking for this uh, nirvana of what it used to be a hundred years ago? No, we're not, you know. I don't think anybody is, but you still want to fight the fight for indigenous species that are being harmed by invasive species. And that's, that's the crux, you know. Invasive species, they interrupt the food web, they interrupt the ecosystem, uh, you know, what is the end result of that going to be? No, nobody knows that. Right. You know what I mean? We don't know it. Some people say snakeheads will be here forever. They may well be. I mean, that's, you can't say that with confidence because they can be susceptible to parasites that they're not susceptible to in their native land. Right. You know, I mean, it's possible. I'm not saying it's likely, but it, it can happen. Sure. You know? Uh, they can manage themselves. Maybe they eat everything and then eat their own. I don't know, you know. Well, that's, that's uh, a lot what of what I'm saying is scenarios. no one's gonna, no one knows what the end result's gonna be. You know what I mean? But from what we see, I, I think, I think the proper course of action to take is what we're doing, which is harvest the fish and yeah, harvest and as it, many as we can. And like you know? we had talked earlier, you know, I mean, you're talking about a fishery here. Even in Maryland, where all snakeheads in the whole state of Maryland, you're really in a box compared to the whole country. Right. You know what I mean? So you talk to a biologist out in any other where any other place, and they're going to say they're invasive fish. They're highly invasive. Everyone knows that as a biologist. You know. Uh, you know. So then, you know, the naysayers are going to say, "Well, show me the data." You know, show me the studies that say and they're we'll, affecting we'll, it. You well, know? we've shown the data. I mean, yeah, we, and there's data. It, there's you know? there's data out there. I mean, I'm sure there'll be data to come There's some coming, sometime yeah. mm-hmm. um, but you're never gonna you're never gonna the thing about an invasive species is you're never gonna know the entire impact of what that fish did you know what i'm saying so in other words you don't you know nobody's studying the impact on frogs you don't have any base data from the from before they were right. here on what their impact on frogs but it sure seems logical you know that it's going to have an impact on frogs or on has. muskrats, oh. or on ducks, or on other fish. You know, the the just the anecdotal data that we've seen. I mean, sure. the, you ride around at nighttime down below here, and and you don't hear the frogs like you used to. I mean, yeah. even when I was a kid, let alone when sure. Gary was, right. was a you kid. Hunt, so. You hunt early season. I do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do Do you remember five six years ago where you'd be sitting in the stand at the edge of dark, and you couldn't hear? A sick of deer walking up on you for the bullfrogs? Oh, yeah, right. You, sure. Did you hear them last year? No, nope. I don't hear much any. Okay, same way. I noticed that that's with the frogs more than any other thing. That's the scariest thing for me. Through hunting. I mean, I don't think people just, realize. They're just not there anymore. I don't think people realize the, 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 the impact of frogs in the ecosystem yeah. here. Sure. You know, the tadpoles eating the mosquito larvae. I sure. mean, there's yeah. the crayfish. I mean, we look at the crayfish. There's You don't see holes on the ditches no more. They're gone. 
They're right. not there. I mean, right. you look at the ditches that I used to pot three years ago and got 40 to 60 pounds of crayfish over four or five days to go sell them a crab stand. Right, right. I ain't caught a crayfish in two years, man, yeah. in that yeah. same area. Not one, and that's not a lie, not one. Yeah, I you know. So, yeah. So let's talk about, because I know there's some things that you've done, you know, on your own, some scale sampling, some rings and things like that. A lot of people ask about aging of the snakehead. And mm-hmm. I know that you and me, we've talked about some stuff. We've shared some mm-hmm. some information. So I don't want to put you on the spot, but when we're seeing 13 to 15-inch fish, are we seeing one-year-old fish? You know, I, my, my aging that I've done on my own has been with scales, and scales on snakeheads are tough, you know, because they grow so fast. Uh, scale aging is a technique that works very well in, uh, you know, middle to northern latitudes where you have a distinct growing season and then a winter shutdown and then a distinct growing season. So those annual sub interannual rings are much less in the scale itself. So in other words, you get this big cluster of tight rings, which makes its own ring which is wintertime when they're not growing. And then you get the growth pattern where they're in between. So then you count those rings as years. So it's sim- similar to, to aging trees, basically. Exactly, so, yep, so. very similar. So in, in a tree, you know, they'll look at a tree and say, oh, you know, this was a good year. See how wide that gap is between those two mm-hmm. annular yep. rings? Mm-hmm. You know, and then all oh, this year it was very, you know, must have been a drought that year, you know, and they look back at the data all year as a drought that and they year. They can so. go way back with that, with the dendrochronology or whatever yeah, it is, they can go back and... Because of the weather patterns, they can tell you for a long hundreds of years. It's amazing, yeah, stuff. absolutely. Yeah. So, so, so from what you've seen in your own opinion, I mean, what do, what do you think we're seeing growth like in a year's time, roughly? I mean, you, do you agree with what these biologists saying that some of the you fish know, are growing 13 to 15 inches in a year, some of them are growing yeah. 8 to 10 in a year? Yeah. Now, yeah. now, being a biologist, let's talk about largemouth bass growth versus snakehead growth. Who grows faster? Oh, man, I'm mistake heads are growing fast, you know. Point I mean, made. Look that's, at that. That's why that's, it's very hard to age their rings because they're just, it's so many rings. You know, where's the density of the annual density? You know, it's hard to figure that out. Uh, the, you know, the sure way to age a snakehead is to have a control group of a known aged fish. You know, you release them. Uh, then you catch them at intervals over time. Pop the odalus out. Look at the old list, either cut them, crack them, and burn them, uh, and then you get your definitive age for size class. But that's a lot of, you're talking a lot of data, you know. Right. There's a good chance, you know, a lot of state agencies or federal agencies aren't going to spend that kind of money, you know. I mean, I started doing it because I was curious, you know. Right. You know, I'm catching these fish. I see people catching these other fish. I'm telling fish. you all these stories. You're not sure if they're true or not. And this guy's got more <laughs> shit with him than a flock of turkeys. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, yeah, I started doing it myself. And, you know, I started, uh, you know, independently looking at this scale and asking someone that I knew at work that has experience doing it, looking at it. It's not what we do, but, you know, from their years of experience and saying, how old do you think this fish is, you know, compared a lot of that to the, um, the Virginia – DGIF, their stuff, you know, on age, and it seemed seemed similar. You know, I was just curious if they're growing faster here than they were in the Potomac or, uh, you know. Do you think they're growing faster here? Is that too tough a question for me to ask? Yeah, no, I mean, for what I've looked at, it's hard to say, you know. It's hard to say. I haven't collected enough and recorded enough data to say this is what I think, you know. What do you like most about snakehead fishing is it is it is it the bounty that's provided through the meat is it the is it the the chase is it the challenge is it the top water bite is it yeah you know else? i think that uh went out one time in the canoe you know i'm not a kayak guy i got a canoe and i went out and uh to a spot you told me yeah you know, went out there caught a an eight pounder i you remember know? i remember you're so excited <laughs> and i had my canoe blown up against the marsh grass and <laughs> Man, I couldn't get that thing in the net, you know. I felt like it was like reading the field and stream cover, you know, where the <laughs> rod's bent and the guy's trying to get it in the net, you know. I'm like, hmm. holy cow, man, these things are pretty cool, you know. They're a lot of fun to catch. They are a lot of That's fun. That's sporty, you know. 
Yeah, that's why you need a separate cameraman. That's that's right. Right. <laughs> we were trying to do that. Me and him were trying to do that in the pond. Today. I'd hook one back. Here, you video, you video, and then we would be too late. You know. um, so, you know, I mean, I see that value. There's definitely value there, you know. But you can't get tunnel vision either. There's value in a lot of other fish in Maryland, you know. Yeah, I see a lot of guys on the page ask, like, oh, where can I go an hour from X to catch snakeheads or a you know, half hour from here, you know. It's like. And I drive two and a half hours every time I come down here. That's, you know, that's just, while, that's the price you pay, you know, while to go we're, to the good places. While know? we're talking about driving places, and let's talk a little bit about the Upper Bay. Let's talk a little bit about what we're seeing up there. Um, I know that that's not your job, but let's realistically talk about what we're visually seeing. I mean, yeah, I mean two, two, three years ago in the gunpowder, you didn't see but maybe one or two here and there. Yeah. And, and now you're seeing 20, 30, 40 fish days. I yeah. mean, you're seeing shoot guys shooting 100, you know, 75, 100 a night. Yeah. And the Bush River, I mean, it's look crazy, at what's man. going on there. I mean, and, and, and the, the thing that's killing me, man, is that these guys just... Well, I mean, big deal. you know, no big deal. Big it, deal. I guess it could be argued that they were put there, you know, by someone, sure. you know, and that's whoever did that. That's the biggest disservice you can do to the ecosystem that you live in, you know, is to transport invasive species from yeah. one place to another for your own satisfaction and your own gain. It's, 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 it's pure selfishness. It's pure selfishness. Exactly right. You know, those guys, I mean, shad struggle so bad on the whole East Coast, American shad. To recover. You I, mean, know? Talk, I mean, what but, happened to Conway go down? They shut the shad lift down. I mean, what did that do to the shad population? What did that do inhibiting the transport? Well, I mean, it you know was a I mean? no-go this year. I mean, yeah. they ran the lift for four days, I think I read in the paper or something. It wasn't very long, you know. So, 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 uh, so, so now, in reality, no, so nothing was nothing a great was example moved. of a trickle-down right. effect, right? right? No one imagined that, right? Hey, we're going to stop running. We're going to stop passing shad because we're passing snakeheads. We don't want them to go upstream. Right. Not a good thing, you know. All those juvenile out migrating shad that come out of the river in the fall. And, and, yeah. and that's another thing, you know, that, that, that I think that a lot of people need to be looking at. You know, this whole striped bass decline. I mean, if you look at the nursery areas where these snakeheads are, the flats, you know, you look at, you look at the, the, the Dundee complex. I mean, you look at these areas sure. that these rockfish are utilizing six months of their early life stage before they migrate these rivers for the right. next two or three years till they're big enough to make the migration to New Hampshire. Right. You know, so that, I... That has to be the next evolution of snakehead study. It has to be. Well, that's what, the, that's what I'm saying. I mean, it, there's too many facts that I see. I mean... You know, when I've got guys that are on the Susquehanna Flats and they say they're watching the snakeheads, three or four or five in a pack, root through the grass, pushing the fish out of the grass so they can eat them. Sure. I think what people don't understand is that, you know, largemouth bass and rockfish, they can't really fly through grass like that. They don't have that body shape like that torpedo, you know what I'm saying? Right. right. So them snakeheads, just like a pig, can get in the mud and root, 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 and push, right. push, push, push. You'd think about the growth rate of the babies, and if you're talking about a fish that's growing 14 inches in a year, you can't tell me that they're not eating the shit out of every piece of fry that's in the grass trying to make a life. Everything. I mean, not just a fry. You know, what you know, about, you know, what about, what about little crabs and stuff? Yeah, like well, well, that's what I'm saying. I little mean, little invertebrates, right. and all that, st all those, you know, bottom of the food web is so important to the whole system going up all the way to the predators, you know. That's being interrupted big time, you know. When How you're talking, can you not look but, at but that? But what people say know? is, well, well, bass eat, you know, bass eat all fish too. They're predatory also. But, yeah, they are, but they're not as fecund as a snakehead is. So right. they're not, you know, only spawn them once a year. Uh, they, they're they just not. They don't know, have the same metabolism. It's, I'd like to sugarcoat it, but they're just not. The same. It's not a. It's not. I don't want you to apples. sugarcoat it, Rob. I want you to be it's, real it's with not these a people. Good comparison, you know, is what I'm saying. Well, it's it's like with. The skate. Skate come in, and they're here for a season. They don't stay year-round. But they come in, and they root through the grass, and they clean the soft crabs up. On the other hand, rockfish swim over the grass. If they see something, they'll certainly grab it. Oh, yeah. it but they're really hitting the bald spots and stuff like that. They don't really root through the grass. But then you turn around with a snakehead, he's doing the same thing. So he's cleaning up wherever he's at, and he's just not looking for a salt crab. He's looking for anything. And, and, and the biggest moving. thing that nobody seems to keep in mind here is this fish doesn't need a foot of water to live, man. It only needs enough water to cover its body. If it's yep. got enough water to cover its body, it's got enough water to eat. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I yep. just. I, 
And it, you know, just to, to say like, man, I really, I love, I understand what all those guys are saying, but you know what? I just love catching them, and therefore I want them here. I want them everywhere I can find them because I just love to catch them. You know, you you really need to adjust your outlook you know it's the I other mean, resources like, i really like to go catch steelhead in new york state you Me know too. they're eight ten twenty pounds sometimes you yeah. know you catch those fish and you'd be like when you're there you're like i'm never going trout fishing again why would i ever go you know <laughs> right <laughs> then you come back here and you're like you, it's got to be in perspective you know go catch a bucket of white perch that's fun in its own way yeah. you know go catch some shad you yeah. know shad are such a historic fish i mean it's cool to go up there and catch some white shad because of the history of that fish. It's just amazing. You know? I am like curious. Just shooting a sucker and a and a white tail. And a, a, well, a sucker and, and a Montana elk. Right. You know. Right. right. I'm I'm curious to see what the data shows next year in shad numbers, in comparison to the year before this year. Like we, yeah. You know, I want to I want to see numbers next year when they go to transport because you're going to see the decline from not moving them fish. Yes. I really think that Man. you are. Because, again, those fish have reproduced, and now they're below the dam. They're not up in them normal areas. Right, right. So what is that going to do to the fish that need forage in the other reservoirs above the dam? See, these are the depths that people don't think about. You right, know what I right, mean? Right, sure. I mean, you think about that. If they didn't take 50-some thousand shad up there, there's not 45 million babies swimming yeah. around up in yeah. Harrisburg. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Sure. So, I don't know. I mean, another thing on shad, I mean, you know, we think of it as a Susquehanna because we live here. No. But, you know, I mean, Northeast, uh, Even here. Connecticut River, all those big rivers up there have huge, used to have huge shad runs and they struggle as well, you know. And people can't figure it out, you know. They're passing them. Uh, you know, that's a long journey to get all these dams passage in them through licensing processes and right. all that kind of stuff. And, you know, eventually, hopefully, that'll pay off. But the weird thing is, I mean, they transported American shad to the West Coast in California, like in the turn of the century, late 1800s, early 1900s. And the Columbia River last year passed 7.5 million American shad at wow. Bonneville Dam. That's fantastic, wow. That's man. insane, right? That's insane. Gosh. I mean, why are they doing so good out there? But you struggle in all these rivers on the East Coast. I mean, that's every biologist that studies them trying to figure that out. It's what's going on. You know? I know if Jim Thompson had his way, he'd remove every dam in this county. <laughs> <in> his statement. <laughs> <Yeah>. so. <laughs> so, Rob, if uh, if if we can leave the show with you today. Oh, I want. Can I just do a couple of little anecdotes I wrote? Yeah, sure can. Absolutely. Did you know that the old Trinity Church is the oldest standing Absolutely. building in the state of Maryland, and it's right up the street from here? It's also the oldest. Uh, active church, active, active church. Episcopal church, three still, centuries. still in use. In the three centuries States. that church has been in active yep. use. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing! I never knew that. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's so cool. A uh, couple other, uh, another one. I learned to tie a bimini twist last week. Just <laughs> you go, Rob. <laughs> pat myself on the back yeah, on buddy. that one, dude. You teach me sometimes. <laughs> Anything I know is a clinch knot. <laughs> <laughs> And then uh, I was looking, you know, talking about invasive species, trying to think of different stuff to say is like apples, you know. Everyone thinks like apple, apple pie is a great American thing, right? Uh, apples are originally from Central Asia and Kazakhstan and Southern China. Kazakhstan, I like that I name. I did not know that. Yep, yep. And there's se like 750 cultivars of apples, you know, different kinds of oh, apples. Oh, wow. The colonists brought apples here from Europe. Huh. And that's cool they stuff. cultivated them, and that's where you get all these different apples. But they're from Kazakhstan, of all Johnny places. Apple seed. <laughs> yeah. They're descendants of a different species of the same genus. That's. I wild. didn't ask you this question. There. Have you hunted out of the country? Uh, where did I hunt? I hunted Canada bear hunting a long that time counts. ago. <laughs> Mexico, I haven't hunted, but I fished there quite a bit. What did you fish for? Peacocks? We went to El Salto. El Salto? Yeah. Did you get any 13-pound so, or 15-pound oh largemouth? I'm going to say this for my wife. You know, her biggest bass in the house is hanging on our wall, and it's hers. That's awesome. How big is it? Just over 10. Oh, that's nice. 10-2, nice. 10-3. Yeah, monster. And oh, then I, two years later, I got one over 10, so we felt pretty good about that. That was fun. That's a cool fishery down there. I, 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 I've seen – I've had friends have gone out to Castiac and all them places, man, you know, out in California and done all them yeah, big yeah, bass. Yeah, yeah, you know, the big I mean, bass lakes, yeah, right? I right. mean, God, man, some of, the, some of the fish out there, man, good Lord, dude, I can't imagine catching five 15-pounders in a day. One yeah. of the uh, – oh, another great – one of the, another great fact was uh, – which I wanted to talk about was uh, the Redfish Lake Sockeye. So 
you know, nothing to do with snakeheads, but it's pretty cool in a fisheries view. Uh, Red Lake sockeyes are in Idaho, Sam in Idaho, and they travel 925 miles from the Pacific Ocean to spawn in Redfish Lake, uh, Holy Idaho. Holy shit. So they go up the Columbia River, the Snake River, into the Salmon River. They gain 6,500 feet in elevation and go through eight major hydro dams. Wow. How many returned last year? 14. It's a journey. You know? Wow. It's tough. They're struggling to survive. It's the southernmost how, population. Do they know how many come salmon. in originally from like out there to how many make it to the end? Is it like hundreds of thousands to 14 it's at the end? It's just counting it at the dams as they come through, you know? Because right. all those dams have fish windows, you know? So wow. They, on the ladder, so they see them come in, and then when they finally get to Redfish Lake, they get counted. I bet you have that. I bet you got to see some cool stuff over the years with what you do. Almost man. a thousand miles. That's crazy to spawn. You know what I mean? That puts That's a whole amazing. new take on the best swimmer. Gary. <laughs> 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 And then one quote I got off of uh, one of the, it was like USGS or Fish and Wildlife Service, and I thought this was good. It's, invasive species are costly, disrupt natural ecosystems, and consequently threaten native species. I mean, that's the bottom line. You can argue it six ways to Sunday, but that's what you have going on here right now. I'll tell you what, Rob, I'm, I'm so grateful that we got you out here today. I mean, I think, I think that it, it was really peril to get you here and to have somebody who came from the neutral zone in the beginning you know, to say where they see after yeah. a period Yeah, I mean, of there's time, a lot, you know? lot to learn about what's going on. Is that going to happen? I don't know. Maybe not, you know. I mean, you'd like to be an optimist and think all these studies are going to be done. Like I said, you know, snakeheads are a small player in a big big fish tank in the, in the long run, you know. We, we mean, talk, excuse me, I don't mean to no, it's okay, you know, go ahead. We, we talked earlier about collecting data. What's a, is there any kind of, like a timeline, how long would it take to gather enough data to be able to accurately predict what's going to happen, what's going on with them? Yeah, I think uh, that'd be a great station, great question for the state guys, you know, yeah. because I don't know what their budget is. I don't know what that, that's a lot yeah. of the problem. Budget and money in, in ten is, you know, I'm I mean? sure with different species, really, it's different times. I don't think I could speak to that, you know. I mean, ultimately, the bottom line is you want as much data as you can get, you know. So. Yeah. You know, is anecdotal not anecdotal data not valuable? Sure, it's valuable. I mean, what you're seeing every day down here as you guys are out there, I mean, that's very important, you know. It, it doesn't get written in scientific papers, but it definitely enriches the view of what's happening. Well, it's like what I told you today, my theory of why I don't have snakeheads in my pond. Yeah. It, you know, there's got to be a reason. Every pond around me has them. Yeah. Right. Maybe it's that snapping turtle. He's been in there. I put him in there before we ever put the rocks down. I have to thank Gary. Maybe it's him. I have to thank Gary and Kaz for helping me catch my best bluegill (laughs) ever today (laughs) in in Gary's pond. I didn't do anything but supply. (laughs) It was was funny, right? Because he caught the freshman and said, oh, my God, man, this is huge. I was like. Don't 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 let me ruin your prey. That's not big, bro. <laughs> you, you ain't even got big yet. And then and then he hit like two more behind it. I mean, I know you now had the some. red ears. I had some red ears too, which get bigger than bluegills. So I mean, there were red ears in there also, but the the pure bluegills were. I, I think I think I think your biggest man. bluegill was probably around twelve at least. I yeah, would say. I definitely. And was um, a beautiful fish. Your red ears were probably I want to say in the eleven to twelve. Uh, we had a few crappy that were probably eleven to twelve, maybe ten to twelve. Yeah. Um, we caught some nice bass. Yellow um, perch. Yellow perch, white perch. Um, we <laughs> just imagine, put them in this year. So you imagine being five or six years old. Oh, out there. my God. That's, that's I'm really, you, that's should give that originally when trip. I put the fish in there, it was, was for, for, man, oh man. for kids and big kids. <laughs> Gary, big kids. I, Gary, Gary, I, had, <laughs> big kids, I, right? I said to exactly. Rob, I said, I called my biggest one over here on this end, and I cast it right, and as soon as it hit the water, man, I said, oh, I got another big one. Man, I pulled that sucker in. Gary, I don't know what it had in its stomach, but I think it had 12-inch bass in its belly, man. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was like, and its stomach was like that big, yeah. man. And yeah, I mean, They've had man. a good year. I got some really good video of the bass spawning. And, that was a and, great video. And some, some oh, crappy cool. spawning. It's really neat just to watch their interaction and all the stuff that they do. It's, 
And like Pretty I was cool. telling Rob, I mean, we, we, we've, been, we've been throwing them. shrimp in there. We've been throwing minnows in there. We've been feeding the hell out of them fish this year. We need, yeah, we, need, we, need, we, need yeah. we need, to get another dose of some food Ms. in there. Miss Pat's know. pumping the pellets in them like mad. <laughs> right I'll on. tell you what, Miss Pat, <laughs> that garden looks feeding. beautiful out there. My yeah. gosh, I walked, I walked around there, seen all them colors in the garden. Beautiful oh. place. Yeah, man. Beautiful place. Appreciate Jeffrey. you letting me fish there. Do you have any problems barking at Gary's? No. We didn't. <laughs> oh, you know what? Some county guy drove by slow, but <laughs> let's uh, l- l- let's get into that now. <laughs> let's talk about parking now, and then we'll get into the giveaway because we know we're getting up on time here. We're at fifty-five minutes. So, How do you um, want to go with that? So we uh, we actually met with some people from the county today, rode around and, and looked at all these different spots, and we've got a plan in action here now. Um, these spots will be open back up again. It's just a matter of when, not if. And so it, it, the, we're working on it. It's not going to be as fully open as it was before. There's still going to be some no parking at, at these different places. Uh, um, but you're still going to be able to fish. We're going to have these things open. It's just a matter of when they can get these signs changed around and moved around. So, I know you got to understand safety is, is a huge factor. That's the biggest right? thing here, yeah. And, well, and, and, and people need to be able to, in passage, people even be able to get down the roads and get back safely. But and it's the same way with people fishing. You need to be able to fish safe. It doesn't do you any good to be standing crowded on a road when cars are coming by, zipping by you and could, could hit you and kill you. Exactly. So and, and, and we agree that, you know, that, that some of the places it's too tight. You know, that we need to, you know. Extremely too tight. So, but, but the key to making sure these spots remain open is be diligent about doing the right thing, guys. Make sure you're pulled all the way off the road. No tires on the road. Make sure you're picking up your trash. Be a good angler. Be don't, a steward of the outdoors. Don't go cutting trees and making right. your own trails in places. I mean, that's that's just some bullshit, mm-hmm. man. You know, there's plenty of places to fish. You don't got to go on somebody else's property and cut their limbs or cut like the frag that. or whatever. You can't block you driveways. Know? Right. You know, you just you got to be courteous. That's, that's, that's it. all. That, and, and we were pretty much under the impression that – if you're not, <laughs> you're going to probably be impressed with what happened. Exactly. We, yeah. we, we, even, we even said the day out there, you know, if, if you can't be smart enough to park off of the road, meaning all your tires are off the blacktop, nothing on the blacktop, mm-hmm. then you deserve a ticket. You know, and I'm sorry. I just I feel yeah. that way. You know, if you can't yeah. play by the rules and, you know, you want to come here and you want to fish, then – you, you deserve the ticket, man. You know, it's we're simply asking you to. You can fold your mirrors in. If yeah. they don't fold in electronically, there's very few vehicles you can't fold the mirror up. Exactly. It's, it's just, just, and you're just given space. It's, it's, like, it's, and, it's and, just common courtesy. And, and you have to. And, 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 and if you're visiting and, and there's a combine coming down the road and they want to get through and they can't, and you say you're not moving your effing car to go F yourself, then that's going to create a problem, too. Right. You know, we can't act like that. Period to anybody, no matter who you are. Pe- people have to remember that when you see farm equipment coming down the road, that's these people's livelihood. That's like somebody coming up to your job and impeding you from doing your job, impeding you from making your living. It's the same thing. It's no different whatsoever. And so you have to remember that when you see a tractor coming through, m- make sure you're out of the way. Point, and, that, that's what and we get it. We, we get it. We're not trying to buck the system and say no. nothing. You know, we're, we understand. And, and I think the coolest thing about this morning was the way that we all just kind of interacted and talked. Oh, yeah. We didn't argue. We didn't fight. We didn't point fingers about who was right no. or who was wrong. It's about finding the solution, you know. Exactly. We can't keep creating more problems on the problems. We have to find solutions to each of these problems. Well, we're all running for Congress this year. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny you say that because, you know, you look at past history, you know, there's a lot of people that want to start out being a politician or be in government as, as in a political level and, and what you're saying is, you know, there's a lot of famous politicians that started out as regular guys. Yeah. Comes to mind, Davy Crockett, mm. Daniel Boone, right? <laughs> they Big frontiersman, right? But what happened? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they didn't start at 65. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, that's all it boils down to, guys. We're going to have these yeah. spots back open. It's going to be a little bit more limited capacity than it was in the past, but... They are going to be open to fish, but just make yeah, sure you're right. doing the right thing. And, and, and let's let's touch a little bit about our meeting over at Blackwater. Oh, you know, oh yeah. I, I you know, forgot. To you know, we had you. a meeting the day before yesterday over yep. at Blackwater with Marsha. And um, look, y'all, Blackwater's working to try to get some stuff done, too. This we, is we, amazing yeah, that they're we, doing this. We can't go into too many details on yeah, this. Not but, yet. but Blackwater definitely has some stuff in the works yeah. to make things even more accessible for, for the anglers. Yeah. They want you catching snakeheads. That's the bottom line. They want you catching these things. Yeah. They want to preserve this march. Marsh as much as possible. It's, That's you know, great it's to hear. Safety, safety yeah. first, but I, I, I gotta, I gotta say today that was a, that was a great interaction. It was, great, man. I mean, great. a lot of any people complain about law enforcement. They complain about county officials, whatever. I, I can honestly say, in my lifetime, That's I got great. no complaints. No, Every time, if I got stopped, it was because I deserved. It. 
And uh, so, but even then, I've never had any bad interactions. Mark's asking right now about what spots are closed. So, Mark, a lot of the places here on Maple Dam and the course, you know, a lot of the spots you can still fish the areas. Uh, you just have to make sure that you're off the road, but they closed some of these areas for the last couple of weeks just because we were having some issues with parking on the pavement and uh, guys not willing to move their vehicle when a farmer was coming down the road. So um, that's where we are with that, Mark. So if you're coming down here and you want to go fishing, you know, we're going to get these spots, like we said, back to some kind yep. of working order. And, um, you know, it's, it's not. It's, it's still a work in progress, but yeah. we're getting there. So I mean, it's not, it's not that the county doesn't want anybody here. It's not that they don't want you fishing. No. It's that we want everybody to be safe when they're here and they're visiting. The other thing that we got to stay on top of is trash, too. And, and, and oh, they yeah. even said the trash isn't the biggest issue. The biggest issue is just the parking. So uh, we, we do want to say we appreciate the guys that are taking time to pick up some trash yep. and, you know, make sure that... Uh, it makes all the difference in the world. You know, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, it might not be my mess, but at least I can be responsible enough to take care of it. Yep. You know, and for those yep. guys out there that are doing the same thing, we thank you and we're grateful for the work that you are doing. So um, Absolutely. Yeah, I like your statement, be a good steward of the outdoors. That's, I, mean, I mean, that's it's all it comes down to. It's a real simple statement, but it's so true, you know? Yeah. Uh, you know that does the outdoors doesn't owe you anything. You know no. it's a it's a privilege in this country uh, that's been created by a lot of people. You know and you know go out there and have fun, enjoy yourself, meet some new people. You know it's not a competition, it's not the rat race that's in the city. You know it's about meeting new people. Go enjoy yourself. You know exactly yeah. right. I belong to a men's group, and, and one of the things we do wherever we meet, whether it's inside, outside, strike is the most important part. Leave it better than you found it. Exactly. We've got another Absolutely. question here from Absolutely. Crystal. She's asking, are the snakeheads spawning right now? Yes, Crystal. Uh, we have pretty much different scenarios depending on where you're fishing at. So you're going to have some fish that are spawning, some fish that are pairing, some fish that are on the bed, some fish that are guarding fry. So like I've told people, keep moving around until you find the area where they may not be in that full spawn mode or they may not be in that on the bed mode. You know, you're going to find branches where they're not in those modes where they're actively feeding. So... You know, it's just a matter of moving around and changing your baits. And uh, like I've always said, make sure you got some kind of live bait on you just in case you can't get something. At least you can catch a catfish or a perch and something, right. you know. So. Anyone more is anybody? No. I appreciate you guys having me on. It's yeah, so man, nice we appreciate you coming yeah, on. Yeah, absolutely. It was a blast having you. Yeah, Rob, Rob, I'm very honored that you're here. I'm very honored mm. to call you my friend. Share I'm, these before we go. I appreciate it, man. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know what? So, so Rob <laughs> Rob brought his box today from his dad to share with us because we all like vintage lures. So I know yeah, Rob's, so. Rob's got a couple lures here that he's going to so maybe my, try to see if he can catch a snakehead on. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not wasting them on that. <laughs> 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 no, I'm kidding. Um, yeah, so my dad passed away uh, a year and a half ago, and – uh, just got his tackle box from my mom's house. So anyhow, here's here's uh, some old lures. Uh, what's what's the name of that one? This was the Bass Ackward. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that man. And then uh, Dalton Special. That was a big yep. big timer back man, in the day. And that thing right there would destroy. You know what that reminds me of? The Mega Frogs, kind of the jump frogs, mm, similar, a little bit yeah. the way they are. It's a copy and right then, in front. Uh, the that creek, one too. Creek Chub Plunker. Yeah. You know, mm. I'm not even sure what this one is, but it's a whole box of them. Twin torpedo. Man, nope, I can't do it. Never mind. <laughs> That's all right. I got a whole box of them. So it was fun to open that box and see uh, actually more so the smell of it. It reminded me of <laughs> it took was, me back 40 years. Well, you know? when you open that box up in here, I think we all smell <laughs> it too. You know? yeah, and it's pre-plastic. There's a lot of, <laughs> lot of wood in there. Oh, right? yeah, That's cool. Yeah, exactly. So I was glad to share it with you guys. I appreciate that you, you appreciate it. So what do you guys want to do? You want to give away some shit or what? It's that time, isn't it? Yeah. Am I, am I eligible or not? No, nah, you're not eligible. Oh, but but I, 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 I have some goodies for you before you go home. <laughs> don't you worry. Um, all right, folks. Oh, hold on one man. second. One second. Um, Rob, there's a question for you here. Okay, great. Um, are you healing up since your last snakehead has Oh, my goodness. That that's, incident. that's a heckler. That's, that's a heckler. <laughs> that must be a heckler. <laughs> Bill, he just called you a heckler. <laughs> no. Can you share that with us? The real brief story is I... Really had, you know, I like the old ways, so I had the hots to get this three-quarter axe, and I looked at him for, <laughs> for months. This doesn't and sound good I already. Got this axe in the mail, and it's beautiful, and it says very sharp, and I knew it was very sharp. And the first night, I went out at lunchtime that day, cut a couple little trees with it, went out after work, glanced it off the shed right into my calf. Oh, laid me oh wide man. Open. Is it why you got this 30 boots on today? Yeah. <laughs> 
Did you get stitches? Oh, uh, yeah, it was all the way down to the muscle. Are nasty. you serious? Holy cow. 30 some stitches. Chop, chop. Got you. Damn, good. Bill, way to call so. the man out like that. <laughs> <laughs> it was um, in my product review, I said, I can assure you it's very sharp. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, let's do this thing. Let's give away some crabs. Let's give away some free stuff. All right, folks, it's time. It's now the Sunday Fun Day giveaway. All right, look, folks, we're giving away a ton of stuff this week, but first we're going to start with my good friend Cletus Bentz. Cletus Bentz, you have won this week Kapow! the Midshore Flishing Club raffle. So your name's going to go in this raffle, and you're going to be put into a raffle for a free snakehead trip down here on the snakehead grounds, my friend. So congratulations Sweet. on that. From Meps, our good friend over at Meps. Look, if you're not throwing Meps here in the refuge, you're just not catching fish. So, look, Meps lures. We're going to give away two Meps today. This is a Meps Aglia 5, hot pink. Make sure you look at Leroy's catch this week because he got that on the hot pink. So, Matt Morse, I'm going to give you a Meps Aglia number 5. And Ron Hampton, I'm going to give you a Meps Aglia number three because these were, these were two of the best Meps that produced this week. All right, from WickedStickers.com, my good friend Eris Matos. Look, if you have a small business, you need anything made for your business, hats, shirts, stickers, pens, I don't care what you need, placemats, rugs, towels, underwear, we'll make it for you, okay? It's very simple. So from WickedStickers.com, Charlie Parker, we're going to give you the crab stand giveaway package this year or this week from WickedStickers.com. From Stonebridge Grill out there in, in uh, Parkton, Maryland, my good friend Mitch, he's one of the best chefs I've ever seen in my life next to a few other guys that I know. Look, if you want some true blue seafood, you want to get out there to uh, the Stonebridge Grill. Look, there's all kinds of stuff they've got on the menu. The restaurant's open back up. Uh, there's going to be some social distancing. The outside is open, too. So, uh, look, Hillary Bomert, B-O-M-E-R-T, you get the $20 gift card for the Stonebridge Grill. Outlaw Barbecue. My good friend Steve Rogers over at Outlaw Barbecue. Look, folks, his seasoning is amazing. If you haven't had the ribs that they make, or we've had some of the uh, the pastries down here, some of the oh, yeah. coffee Ooh, cakes, yeah, some baby. of the strawberries, some of that stuff. <laughs> look, folks, you don't know what you're missing out there. So, look, so from Outlaw Barbecue, Sissy Bowling Turner, we're going to give you that gift card for Outlaw Barbecue. Look from the crab stand. Sherry Thomas, look, I'm going to give you a free dozen crabs. But look, here is the one that we've all been waiting for all week. I told you, nice. after July 4th, you know, we were going to have a good weekend. We were going to give away something really special. So I'm going to give away a whole bushel of guaranteed Maryland crabs what? to what? Lisa what? Myers. Yeah, Lisa Myers. A bushel, a bushel. Lisa, Man. you're going to have a lot of people sending you friends requests this week. So look, Lisa, you come out to either the parking location, the admin location, and you do the same thing, Sherry, this weekend, and we're going to give you guys some free crabs. Look. We've got the best Krabby Jingle out there, and if you've never heard the Krabby Jingle from the Crab Stand, you just don't know what you're missing. So look, folks, before we leave you today out here at Blackwater's Edge, let's leave you with a little Krabby Jingle. My crabs, they have three first names. It's heavy, full, and fat. My crabs, they have a fourth name. Absolutely mustard-packed! <laughs> So, if you ask me where they're from, see, I eat the mustard, I eat the mustard, I eat the mustard. They're all guaranteed Maryland number ones. At the crab stand, here's a fact I know for sure you're coming back. Kapow! Kapow! And Kapow, folks, we'll see you next week!